Hi, podcast listeners. This is Leslie Law, your host for Sandbox Radio. Thanks to everyone who contributed during our season fundraiser on Indiegogo. We have three more all-new live shows coming up in 2016. Gold Rush, August 29th at Town Hall. Our special Halloween show, The Shadow Knows, at Town Hall on October 31st. And finally, on December 30th, ring in the new year at ACT Theater with New and Improved. Join us at a live show and hear what your donations helped us create. And remember, if you miss an episode live, you can hear highlights broadcast on KUOW 94.9's Speakers Forum. Check the schedule online at KUOW.org. Visit sandboxradio.org for venue and ticket information and to make a financial contribution. Thanks for the life support. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast of Sandbox Radio. This episode was recorded at ACT Theater in Seattle on June 6th in 2016. The Bridal Issue featured musical guests, the Sirens of Swing, the talented kids from Cello X, and special guest storyteller Tina Rowley. So here we go with The Bridal Issue. Sandbox Radio will stay Words become things. Sandbox Radio. Sandbox Radio. Sandbox Radio. Sandbox Radio. Good evening. Heart of downtown Rain City, Seattle. Coming up in the show tonight, Sandbox Radio presents new plays by Lisa Halpern and Elizabeth Hepburn. A short story from delightful Scott Augustine. Musics from Peggy Platt. Special guest sound effects artist from Classic King FM, Marta ZK. The wonderful Tina Rowley. And special musical guest, Cello X and the Sultry Sirens of Swing. Sandbox Radio players and the Sandbox Radio Orchestra, led by Jose Juicy Gonzalez. So, sit back and relax as we take you into the world of Sandbox Radio Live. to you. Coffee? Mind reader. I'm hungry. Want me to whip you up my famous bowl of cereal? You spoil me. So, uh, how was your date last night? Okay. Nick forgot his wallet. You know, if you deconstruct his name, it's Nick. <laughs> Ick. Subliminal warning. Message received. So, how was your date? Mm, not something I'd like to repeat. Sorry, bubs. I'll get the coffee. Thanks. Hey, give me your opinion. 
What do you think of this outfit? Cute. Really? Is this a trick question? No, I just... I can always tell when you're holding back. Really? Yeah, your forehead always does this little crinkle thing. I have a little crinkle thing? Yep. Don't you think it's a little rustic that your truthometer is my forehead? Admit it. You hate this outfit. I won't. You, my friend, are adorable. You could wear a paper bag and... Speaking of paper bags... What? The bridesmaid dress. You knew your sister wouldn't want anyone to outshine her. Does that mean I have to look like a bloated eggplant? (laughs) Oh, God, that's her distractor. I'll climb out the window. Be brave. Is that big box for me? Is my little sister home, Dorco? Hey, Carrie. I brought the dress. Great. Um, you're not really going to wear that pinkness, are you? What do you mean? Pink is the new black. No, ever since Sandra Bullock turned 50, 40 is the new black. (laughs) Baby blue is the new pink. Now, try it on. I'll try it on later. I'm not leaving till I see you in it. Okay, okay, fine. Back in a flash. Ah, 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 here. Now. Oh, come on, Jack is- Jack is gonna turn around and eat. Right, Dorco? You got it, Sarge. Here goes nothing. Whoa, it's so purple. I love purple. That's just a whole lot of look. Enough with the commentary. Holy crap. Did I look? I look like a grape job of the hut. What? Oh, oh my God. What? It's not that bad. It's hideous, and it's five sizes too big. Oh, so they got the wrong size. 12, 22. You could see how that could happen. What's as big as an elephant, purple as rain, and can obscure a human being with a single zip? This dress. Shut it, dude. I'm not wearing this. Uh, yes, you are. We'll get it altered right now. I gotta work. Wait, wait. Um, I've been desperate to talk to you about Nola. What's she done this time? She's weaseled her way into being a bridesmaid. Why did you say yes? Uh, because I'm not a bitch, Lena. What else was I gonna say? God, the last thing I need to be worrying about is who she's going to try to have sex with after the ceremony. I mean, it's my wedding, right? Apparently. Sometimes I just think it'd be better to elope. Oh, that's a great idea! (laughs) Oh my God, Nina. How can you say that? It's my wedding? Besides, if you elope, you don't get half the presents. Right. Sorry. All right, we better get going. Carrie, I'm already late for work. Colin's sick. Good luck transforming that gargantuan taffeta bruise. (laughs) I hate you, Jack. Have fun. Welcome to Paula's Wedding Palace. We treat you like royalty. Look. (laughs) Look. I didn't order a size 22. I'd like to exchange it for a size 12. We don't do exchanges. Oh, you have got to be kidding me. Do I look like I'm kidding? Well, then I'd like you to alter it for free. Well, I'd like to win the lottery. You have a choice, honey. Pay for the alteration, or she wears it as is. Fine. Extortion. Uh, <clears throat> put it on, honey. I hate my life. <laughs> Let me zip that. Carrie, even if she alters it, it's gonna look awful. Can't I wear something? Don't you dare say another word about the dress. Let's see. I'm never getting married. Oh, you say that now, but just you wait. No, seriously, never. Why not? Never seen it work. Ow! Sorry, occupational hazard. Anyway, trust me. Not all marriages are bad. Trust. That's the thing. The whole thing is supposed to be based on trust, but nobody is ever honest with each other. What are you talking about? Ben and I are completely honest with each other. Oh, really? So you've told him that your nails, boobs, and eyelashes are fake? No. But... And he knows that you sneak out of bed in the morning to put on makeup before he wakes up. (laughs) No, but... But nothing. If two people can't tell each other their little truths, how are they supposed to be expected to find the courage to tell each other the big things? 
I'll give you the truth. If you never take the dress off, it'll never get altered. Boom. That's what the truth sounds like. Here you go. Please accidentally lose that dress. I'll give you a really big tip. I'll give you a tip. You're a grown woman. You don't have to wear a dress that you hate just because someone else wants you true. Hey, that is not helpful. Let me talk to your boss. I am the boss. You're... you're Paula? There's no Paula. It just goes nice with palace. Paula's palace. <laughs> nice ring, right? There's no Paula? What about truth in advertising? Pot kettle. <gasps> <laughs> I'll have this sewn up in a jiffy. Come back in an hour. Who says jiffy anymore? I heard that. <laughs> so come on, Lena. What's your real... Oh, a triple shot soy latte, not too hot. Decaf drip, please. Spill it. What's your ish with marriage? It's just that... Well, there are so many things, intense things in life that people don't talk about. Like what? Like buying a house, having a kid, menopause, grief, you name it. Everybody goes through it, but nobody tells you what any of those experiences are really like. So when it happens to you and it's not the fairy tale you've been sold and it's hard or painful, you think you're crazy. Here you go. Oh, thanks. <laughs> like, you're the only one going through it, so you must be a freak or a loser or broken in some major way when the truth is nobody ever talks about the hard stuff, so everybody just feels isolated and sad and scared. I hear you. But just because you're scared doesn't mean you should avoid all of those experiences. Sure it does. Lena, your significant other can't just be Netflix. Why not? Remember what Grandma Minnie used to say? Wear a little lipstick, you'll look prettier. No, the other thing? Uh, in order to experience the highs of life, you have to allow for the lows. Easy for her to say. Not really. What do you mean? She worked at the Brownsville Boys Club and was a social activist at a time when women were supposed to stay home and take care of their kids. That's another thing that no one talks about. What to do if you're a nonconformist. All I'm saying is, if you only live in your comfort zone, your comfort zone shrinks. If you step out, it grows. Too risky, Dr. Phil. Love is worth the risk. So says Hallmark. Listen. If you play it safe, your life will be neutral, hmm? The thing is, you still experience the lows, but you for sure won't have access to some of the amazing highs, and they're the whole point of being alive. How do you know? I don't, but mom did, and I trust mom. Yeah, but look how her and dad turned out. I know, but she got us out of that deal, and she learned more about what she needed from a partner to be happy. When did you get so smart? Hello? Ta-da! Here you go, sweetie. That was fast. I'm a magician. Go ahead, try it on, doll. Oh, yippee ki -yay. You're just afraid. Of this dress? Yes, yes, I really am. <laughs> no, you're afraid if you tell your roommate that you love him, he won't feel the same way. I don't love him. Me think the lady protesteth a lot. Too much. Huh? Me think the lady protesteth too much. Whatever. You love him. Not true. Oh, now who's the liar? Okay, so maybe I do. Maybe I... I love him. Ha! A little. But... I'm afraid it'll ruin our friendship. Oh, that's a tired old song. If it's a real friendship, it can withstand a little one-sided love. You think it's one-sided? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. What are you saying? <laughs> she's saying that even if he's not in love with you, if he's really as good a friend as you think, he'll get over the awkward moment of declaration. In the scheme of things, there are worse things that could happen to a person than having someone tell them they love them, no matter what. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'll ask Jack to be my date for the wedding. Woo, now you're talking. Thanks for the pep talk. What are older sisters for? Beautiful. Now, try the dress on, for God's sakes. I hate my life. 
Oh. Oh. Mm. That dress looks good. Uh, it does. Hey. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Let's find you a different dress. The Mouse Who Went to the Country by James Thurber. Once upon a Sunday, there was a city mouse who went to visit a country mouse. She hid away on a train the country mouse had told her to take, only to find that on Sundays, it did not stop at Beddington. Stop at Beddington. Oh no! Hence, the city mouse could not get off at Beddington and catch a bus for Silbert's Junction, where she was to be met by the country mouse. The city mouse, in fact, was carried on to Middleburg. Next stop, Middleburg. where she waited three hours for a train to take her back. Oh, rats! When she got back to Beddington, she found that the last bus for Silbert's Junction had just left. No! Wait! So she ran, and she ran, and she ran, and she finally caught the bus and crept aboard. Phew! only to find that it was not the bus for Silbert's Junction at all. Oh, come on! But was going in the opposite direction through... Pell's Hollow and Grum. To a place called... Wimberley. Last stop, Wimberley. When the bus finally stopped. <laughs> the city mouse got out... <sighs> into a heavy rain. and found that uh, there were no more buses that night going anywhere. To hell with it. (laughs) Said the city mouse. And she walked back to the city. Moral, stay where you are. You're sitting pretty. This portion of Sandbox Radio is brought to you by Classical King FM 98.1 and their new project, Second Inversion, a 24-7 online stream of contemporary classical, cross-genre, and experimental music from around the globe, inviting you to rethink classical. And while you're at it, visit the King FM table at intermission and find out more. Buckets of rain, buckets of tears Got all of the buckets coming out of my ears Buckets of moonbeams in my hair You got all the clouds, honey, baby, I can stay All a bride wants on her wedding day is to be beautiful As beautiful as she's ever been and happy, as happy as she's ever been all day. That's all, that's all she wants all day from when she wakes up. The good news is that you can forcibly make these things happen. (laughs) The harder you want it, the more important it feels, the easier it is. That's true. I do wonder about grooms. I've never been one. Grooms, do you feel like you have to be the handsomest man you've ever been? Or just 
pretty good. Pretty cleaned up. Spiff, but not full Clooney or anything. <laughs> Being a woman is easy. That's one of the main easy things that makes this easy day even easier. <laughs> We're valued above all for what's inside us. We can show up for our weddings looking like the normal humans we are every day, just maybe slightly cuter, like the men folk do it. And we don't have to transform into living goddesses. No, we don't. We don't have to. We actually don't. We don't need to. We've never needed to. <laughs> I've had three weddings, so I know what's going on. Two husbands, three weddings. Two big weddings, one little courthouse number. I've sampled this buffet. I haven't had an Indian wedding or a Catholic wedding, and two husbands is pretty mild. I'm not Elizabeth Taylor or Zsa Zsa Gabor, but I know of what I speak. What a wedding day is, and not the ceremony, but the day itself, the time leading up to the wedding, is a test. Can you roll with it? Can you remember what's important and what isn't? My first wedding was in Tacoma, some 20 years ago at Point Defiance Park. We lived in Seattle, my fiance and I, and we got mostly ready at home and then drove down separately. Because he was leaving first, Tom took the first bath and all the hot water. I took the cold, crying, yelling second bath. Tom heated large, apologetic pots of water and poured them into the bathtub, achieving tepidness. And then he fled wisely to Tacoma. I shaved my legs and swore and cursed his name. And then my maid of honor picked me up and drove me down to Tacoma, and everything got better. And, and I got myself looking as close to goddess-like as I was going to get, put on my little pearly crown and veil, and, and we went to drive from the getting ready space to the wedding space, but the keys got locked in the trunk. <laughs> Shit! A man appeared. A person nearby who saw a crying bride and her purple bridesmaid frantically messing with the trunk and took pity on us and gave us a ride. His car was filled with clouds and clouds of dog hair. And I'm wildly allergic to dogs, of course, because that's the test. But that's fine. We made it. Nuptials occurred. I was in love with somebody else at the time and already knew I was making a mistake. <laughs> but hey, that's not a day of kind of problem. <laughs> my next wedding was 10 years later. The courthouse wedding to my current, and I'm going to say, final husband. I've loved him this whole time, so it's looking good. The wedding happened at 11 a.m. I wore a skirt and sweater. We bought a bouquet at Larry's Market, rings at Pacific Place, rolled down to the courthouse, nailed it. I now pronounce you man and wife. Get married at 11 a.m., everybody, at a courthouse. You can't screw it up, and the rest of the day is yours to just chill out and be in love, real casual. My last wedding day, the big summer party post-courthouse wedding for all our friends, that was the testingest. There was no test between me and Dave. We spent the day separately, and like I say, the love was in place, so that wasn't it. The day began dark, weather-wise and otherwise, steel skies, Soggy looking. The wedding was at my mom's house. My dad had died a few months before, and my mom was still grieving, and she wasn't ready to be a wedding mom yet. I wanted her to dig deep 
and find some joy, but that's on me because I've never grieved a husband. We circled each other all day, scowling. And worse, I was fat. I was a fat bride. I, I, I really don't know how else to say it. It's great to be a fat bride. Let me be clear, it's freaking perfect. But this was a test between me and me, and I failed all day. I had a vision for myself as a bride. I had a long peacock blue Art Nouveau dress, and my plan was to give myself messy, curly, absinthe drinking looking hair. I wanted to be a wild, Gustav Klimt kind of bride. But I did my hair myself, and it didn't look like it was supposed to look. And my mom was sad about my dad instead of happy about me. And I was fat, and I did not feel beautiful. I just wanted to cry. My friends arrived, the women in my wedding party. <laughs> And they all looked so gorgeous, like freshly sexed up milkmaids. <laughs> and so happy and relaxed. And I gritted my teeth and tried to figure out how to remember what's important. But then five o'clock came, and Dave and I met out in the back garden for photos. And whoosh, so fast, I got it. Everything I'd been fighting all day, his face erased it. Music started playing in the yard, floating around the trees, and our guests began to trickle in. My little cousin Irina arrived, my flower girl, wearing low heels for the first time in her life. She'd developed the craziest little goose step to parade down the aisle with. I'd given her the option to just walk slow, but she wanted to do it fancy, and her way was a trillion times better. Right before she headed down the aisle, she picked a wild strawberry and popped it in my mouth. A surprise! And then she goose-stepped off and I short-circuited from the sweetness. Buckets of Rain was playing now, our processional. I like your smile and your fingertips I like the way that you move your hips I like the cool way set off at what I thought was the right verse, how we'd worked it out, but I moved too early and arrived at Dave's side on the line. Everything about you is bringing me misery. <laughs> I gestured to the lyric and bowed. Sorry, here I am, your miserable bride. <laughs> and we all laughed, me and my handsome husband, and this crowd of loving friends. And nothing could be wrong, not anymore. And it couldn't have mattered less whether I was the most beautiful bride or not. I was happy, as happy as I'd ever been. We were so locked on to the good part. I'm taking you with me, honey baby, when I go. Tina Rowling! The Very Proper Gander by James Thurber. <laughs> Not so very long ago, there was a very fine gander. He was strong and smooth and beautiful. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he spent most of his time singing to his wife and children. <laughs> One day, Somebody who saw him strutting up and down and singing in his yard remarked, There is a very proper gander. 
An old hen overheard this remark and told her husband about it that night in the roost. They said something about propaganda. She said. I have always suspected that, said the rooster. And he went around the barnyard next day telling everybody that the very fine gander was a dangerous bird, more than likely a hawk. In a gander's clothing. Hawk, a hawk, hawk, hawk. A small brown hen hawk, a hawk, remembered hawk, a time when, hawk, at a great distance, hawk, she had hawk, seen hawk. the gander talking with hawk, some hawk, hawks hawk, in the forest. Hawk, hawk, hawk. They were up to no good. Hawk, hawk, hawk. She said. Then a duck remembered that the gander had once told him he did not believe in anything. He said to hell with the flag, too. Hawk, hawk, hawk. A guinea hen recalled that she had once seen somebody who looked very much like the gander. After all, something that looked a great deal like a bar. <laughs> Finally, everybody snatched up sticks and stones and descended on the gander's house. He was sitting in his front yard, strutting around and singing to his children and wife. Everybody cried. Propaganda! Hawk lover! Unbeliever! Flag hater! Bomb thrower! So they set upon him and drove him out of the country. Moral! Anybody who you or your wife thinks is going to overthrow the government by violence must be driven out of the country. Regard! <laughs> Just to see. <laughs> the pirate on Dirk of Dowdy. One, two, three, and what all the boy alas to see. <laughs> his conscience, of course, was black as a bat, but he had a floppity plume on his hat, and when he went walking, it jiggled like that. <laughs> the plume of the pirate Dowdy. <laughs> Coat it was handsome and cut with a slash, and often as ever he twirled his mustache. Deep down in the ocean, the mermaids would splash. Because of Don Dirk of Dowdy. Moreover, Dowdy had a purple tattoo, and stuck in his belt where he buckled it through were a dagger, a dirk, and a ooh, squizzamaroo. For fierce was the pirate Dowdy. On guard! Ha <laughs> ha, take that! So fearful he was, he would shoot at a puff, and always at sea when the weather grew rough, he drank from a bottle and wrote on his cuff, did pirate Don Dirk of Dowdy. Oh, he had a cutlass that swung at his thigh, and he had a parrot called Pepperkin Pie, and a zigzaggy scar at the end of his eye, had pirate Don Dirk of Dowdy. One, two, three, and... Oi, hey! Oh, no, again! Not he! Yes! The pirate on Dark of Dowdy! He kept in the cavern his buccaneer bold, a curious chest that was covered with mold. <laughs> and all of his pockets were jingly with gold. Oh, jing, went the gold of Dowdy. His conscience, of course, it was crooked like a squash. 
but both of his boots made a slickery slosh. And he went throughout the world with a wonderful swash. Yo ho! Whoop, 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 whoop! Hello, ladies. Did pirates on Dirk of Dowdy? It's true, he was wicked as wicked could be. His sins they outnumbered a hundred and three. But, but oh, he, he was, was perfectly gorgeous to see! <laughs> the pirate daughter of Dowdy! Everybody go Gentlemen, Cello X.
You're listening to Sandbox Radio, The Bridal Issue, from June 2016. Like the show? Tell people about us any way you can. And help others discover this podcast by posting a rating or a review in iTunes and Stitcher. And if you're in the Seattle area, we'd love to see you at a live show. Check venue and show information at sandboxradio.org. Now back to The Bridal Issue and a story from Scott Augustson. This portion of Sandbox Radio is brought to you by Beneath the Streets, offering boutique tours through the historic underground passageways of Seattle's original neighborhood, Pioneer Square. Visit BeneathTheStreets.com and book your tour today. Go underground. Adapted from Sleepover Stories by Scott Augustson. As the closet in the spare room stood on the brink of war, Jay thought back to the two recent occurrences that had led up to this imminent catastrophe. Two seemingly minor events. The first incident happened when Jay was helping his mother water the flowers out front. Hi, Mrs. P. Mrs. Polevsky from down the block was walking down the sidewalk, dragging her ridiculous rolling cart. Jay's mother had on many occasions cautioned him to take what she said with a grain of salt. Did you see the family that's moving into our street? Jay tensed up. This could be one of those grain of salt moments. You know, (laughs) this used to be Greek neighborhood. Jay liked that. He pictured everyone going about their business in togas. No, 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 that wasn't right. Togas are Roman. Uh, Greeks just wore sheets. Did there used to be a Roman neighborhood? There was time long past when I was a girl when everyone had their own neighborhood. Jay liked that too. He thought of the city as a big quilt. Oh, or better, like a cafeteria tray that kept things in separate compartments. He loved those trays and wished he could have one at home. The other inciting incident was that his Aunt Michelle had lost a whole lot of weight and gave Jay's mom all her old clothes. She had a lot of clothes because her best friend Juanita worked in a department store and got an unbelievable discount. Hmm, well, they certainly are snazzy. (laughs) Jay's sister was a little enthralled by the new duds. They're great, Mom. I don't know if they're quite my style. They're a little out there. Oh, Mom. Well, I, I guess I could wear them for occasions. You know, the holidays. I could get fancy at Christmas. Sure, yeah. These are my new party clothes. At one time, the room at the end of the hall was going to be an office. Going to be a craft room. Going to be so many things. It was now the home of a couple of chairs, the old wobbly dining room table, and an empty closet that now acquired Aunt Michelle's hand-me-downs. It was a beautiful spring afternoon, and Jay's mom told him, Go get some fresh air! Which Jay chose to interpret as, Go hang out in the spare room and look at Aunt Michelle's old clothes. (laughs) The first thing he noticed was the colors. Aunt Michelle's tastes were bolder than his mom's. They were plumage meant to attract, not camouflage. Purple? Green? Jay thought back to what Mrs. Prolevsky had said. He decided to take that grain of salt by the horns. So, hanger by hanger, Jay moved the purple to the right and the many green to the left. Ah! Things in their place. Jay sat by the window and started to read a comic book that his religious cousin had sent him. It was poorly drawn and concerned a bear who stole a candy bar and then felt bad about it. When the bear cried and confessed at the end, Jay felt embarrassed for him. Hi. 
It wasn't a friendly high, it was the high of a shop clerk at an expensive store. Hello? A blouse the color of a first day bruise shook slightly. Yes, that's right, I'm talking to you. The blouse shifted so that its plunging neckline faced him. Can I help you? Jane knew he shouldn't let a shirt intimidate him, but it did. Look, I know you thought you were doing a good thing when you sorted us by color, but we clothes actually prefer to be arranged by pattern. You do? See, I'm a solid burgundy, if you're about that sort of thing, and you have me next to a plaid. She thinks she's too good to hang next to a tartan. (laughs) Jay loved plaid, always had. It baffled him that someone might not want to be neighbors with plaid. I don't understand. It's our working class origins. She looks at me and sees lumberjack. Oh, it isn't that at all. It's just that we don't have much in common. Plaid is always so proud of what makes it different from other plaid. Thick stripe, thin stripe, background color, interweaving, traditional new. It's all they talk about. At least we talk, said a cute little plaid skirt from the green side of the closet. You solids do nothing but admire yourselves. Well, without a ridiculously complicated and distracting pattern, said a pair of solid hunter green slacks with a prominent crease. It's easy to see our fine cut. The workmanship and design show through. A busy plaid covers many a tailor's error, my grandpants used to say. Well, your grandkids can just take that and put it in his back. The argument was making Jay anxious. It won't take me long to resort you. Just hang on. Twenty minutes later, the plaids and the solids were no longer touching. Whew. Jay was actually looking forward to getting back to the story of the sinning bear. He turned to go and... Boy, said a jumpsuit. The sort of jumpsuit that looked like it might be confusing to put on, like you might just end up sticking your legs in an armhole, that kind of jumpsuit. Yes? Don't know where you were raised, but a stripe is not a plaid. Don't get me wrong, we like the plaids, but... And so, the stripes were moved to the center, a sort of diplomatic barrier between the solids and the plaids. The stripes, be they broad or pin, became the Switzerland of the closet. Done! Nobody, it turned out, got along with the floral prints. The florals had to be pulled out and laid over the back of a chair. They still smelled quite strongly of perfume. Well, that's because we don't get taken to the cleaners very often, said a floor-length, long-sleeved dress with a cabbage rose design. Is it our fault we're so good at hiding stains? The hound's tooth cape declared. As the only one of my kind, I want extra protection against discrimination. No one is going to bother you. That's what minorities everywhere are told. But just you wait, I'll end up mysteriously crumpled in a ball on the floor. Jay wanted to tell them to keep their voices down. He didn't want to let the other garments in the house know that sorting was an option. What if socks and underwear and gloves and shoes all had a preference of exactly where to go? All of these clothes, they seemed on the verge of something, something awful. (gasps) Jay heard his mom coming up the stairs. He remembered that he was supposed to be outside. He hid, hoping the clothes wouldn't rat him out. (sighs) Honestly, this dress I just can't see wearing. I mean, it's terrific, but just not me. (laughs) A short dress lay on the bed in a patch of light. Oh, Lordy, does this son of a feel good, warm and bright and white? Hello, child. Jay was pretty sure the dress had what was called a southern accent. He was transfixed, but it wasn't just the way she talked. It was her vibrant, swirling pattern. Jay heard murmurs from the closet. They were as curious as he was. I don't mean to be rude, but can I ask a question? Rude? Honey, I feel like we're already old friends. Now what is on your mind, sugar? Can I ask what your pattern is? Oh, I'm a paisley. 
Paisley. Is this where I'll be staying? If it's okay. If it wasn't, Jay could probably smuggle her down to his room. I love it. Nice view, plenty of space. We won't get all wrinkly, scrunched together. We can breathe. Jay paused. Now was the big question, the hard moment. Where would you prefer to hang? Oh, anywhere. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm not particular. In fact, one time I was at the senator's party and little old me was sitting right between a mink and a Chinese silk. A kimono. Really? Asked a little red coat from the closet. What was the pattern on the silk? It was the prettiest little poppies you ever saw. This got the florals attention. (laughs) And they peppered the paisley with questions. The paisley went on about her many adventures. It was during the tale of the sari, the French couture, and the dowager's tweed that the plaid skirt blurted out, Hang with us tonight? No, our side is better. No, our side is better. Don't pay attention to the salad. Jay could hear the harsh edge creep in. How soon before buttons were popped and seams were torn. He knew he'd soon be knee-deep in threads and patches. It would all end in tatters. No, hey, hey, hey. Hey, Hey, now everybody just calm down. The Paisley said with a laugh. (laughs) There is no call for this. I am an easy-going, wash-and-wear kind of gal. My motto is mix and match. Tonight, I'll hang in the middle. And child, what is your name? Jay. Jay. Dear Jay. Tomorrow, can you come by and move me a little to the left and then later a little to the right? Then maybe I can just drape over any old thing. You can do that. Can't you, baby? Uh Uh-huh. So Jay hung the lovely party dress in the center of the closet. Mm. Then he went outside, which is where he should have been all day, and sat under the plum tree. He was pretty sure that like the little thieving bear in the pious comic, he'd been taught an important lesson today. Huh. He just didn't have a clue what that lesson was. And now, another installment of Platitudes from the mind of Peggy Platt. June is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, June 16th is my birthday. On the other, it's the month of weddings. And I am unmarried, just shy of 57. A spinster. And 57. 57 is only good as a steak sauce or a Chevy Bel Air. (laughs) I actually woke up on my 17th birthday to the hit of the day. Janice Ian's gut wrencher at 17. I lost it. My BFF tried to comfort me by saying, My mom says that we're all going through our, like, awkward stages right now. When we get married, we'll look back at this and, like, laugh. It's not like we're old spinsters yet. The definition of spinster from Webster's, or maybe it's Jane Austen, defines a spinster as an unmarried woman of a certain age. Either 30 or 31, tax differ. There's even a Jewish text that says we're used up at 22. Is this the little girl I carry? Too scary. Okay. Surely I'm done for. I'm unmarried, 56 and 9 tenths, and I own four cats. And I've never gotten to force a perfectly lovely woman into perfectly horrible bridesmaid dresses, even though I personally did walk down the aisle of shame in nine yards of pink tulle. As a comic, I've performed for 30 or 40 obnoxious bachelorette parties, (laughs) complete with penis hats. I never got to 
wear my own genitalia tiara while my maid of honor held my hair back and I puked in an alley. <laughs> oh, my puke tastes like peppermint. <laughs> oh, sorry. Shh. I've even officiated five weddings, straight and gay, because everybody gets married but Peggy. But that's nothing when I think I will never get my own gift registry. I need an incomplete set of dishes with multiple gravy boats that are too nice to use. All God's chillin' need gifts. I guess I'm just a bitter spinster like Mary in Bizarro Bedford Falls and It's a Wonderful Life. When George asks, where's my wife, Mary? And the angel replies, it's too horrible. She never married. She's just closing up the library. (laughs) So it's June. (laughs) Strawberries and cherries are ripe. Roses are in bloom and Flag Day. Well, not the best example, kind of a lame holiday, but it is another excuse to wear red, white, and blue. Blue, something borrowed, something blue. Happy June, spinsters. Go to the library and get a book. Ulysses, a book about Bloomsday, June 16th, my birthday, 856 pages of despair. Go ahead. You have the time. It's not like you're married with lives. (laughs) Make a plan. And now, a public service announcement. Don't sit there. That's his spot, and I just vacuumed and fluffed the cushions. Okay. We came here to talk about Riley. Oh, here we go. Every time I start a new relationship... You're always buying him things. And he runs the house. Don't sit there, either. Sometimes he doesn't like the chair, and he sits on the window seat. I'm gonna be sick. Okay, let's just talk about Riley. And Sam, and Rosie, and Sherry... And Eddie, or perhaps the Tuxedo Twins. Come on. We've been friends too long. Tell us about Riley. He's the newest. Nothing to tell. I'm polyamorous. Deal with it. Oh, please. You don't have seven wives. You have seven cats. No judgment. And five litter boxes. Meow. All right already. I love cats. And I can afford it. And there are so many that need good homes. We get it. We both have cats, but there are other ways to help. Like, have you heard of the Furry Faces Foundation? I'm not a furry. We know. Furry Faces is a new kind of cat rescue organization. So I can adopt another cat? No. No. (laughs) There are other ways to help. Cash is good, but they also accept donations of pet food, litter, and toys. And they need volunteers to rescue and feed feral cats. Most importantly, the Furry Faces Foundation is all about keeping families together, making sure cats won't be abandoned or dropped at an overcrowded shelter. My cat's diabetic. Remember last year when I lost my job? I was really scared. I could barely pay my rent, much less afford his medicine, but Furry Faces paid for the vet and a month of insulin, never asked for a dime back, and me and Gandalf are still together. (laughs) Are you crying? Cat dander. (laughs) My allergies flare up when I vacuum. Visit furryfacesfoundation.org today. Give whatever you can, cash, materials, or your valuable time. Help folks keep and care for the cat members of their family. Don't open the door! (laughs) That's furryfacesfoundation.org. Keeping people and pets together. (laughs) 
Ladies and gentlemen, the Sirens of Swing! of Sandbox Radio is brought to you by the award-winning Thalia's Umbrella, presenting plays that dance on the line between comedy and tragedy. For ticket information and more, visit Thalia'sUmbrella.org. <laughs> Chaos, oblivion, the forces that shape our destiny watch as we blunder about within our self-imposed asylums. They are observing us from that unfathomable region. Look up ahead, is that a signpost? What is that, is that a deer? I can't really see that. What was I talking about? I was talking about something important. Oh yes, now I remember! From that place where no living soul returns unchanged, from beyond the box. Are the spices out? Yes, mistress. Light the candles. I'm lighting the candles. 
Hagen. What about the spears? The spears, ma'am. Yes, you done. She may need spears. One never knows the form he could take during the excitement. Or possibly he'll need spears. I'll go fetch him. What is that strange alchemy that makes a marriage a little fire, a little ice, a little something more dangerous? And what happens when the newlyweds toy with powerful tradition and find themselves beyond the box? Tonight's episode, Unbridled by Elizabeth Hepron! The bride is coming, the bride is coming. Is the wedding over so soon? Not much to it. They ate the fish and drank the piss from the steaming gourd. And wrapped that serpent round their waist without a scratch. I saw that part with my own eyes. The bride approaches. The bride approaches. No spears, but here's a hatchet. That will have to do. Place it under her pillow. What about for him? Won't he need a hatchet too? His side of the family should have thought of that. We'll probably bring a damn cannon with him into the bed. Those northerners, they're all bowels and bluster. <laughs> the bride is here. Mother, I ate the fish and drank the piss. You had to, child. Northerners always eat the fish and drink the piss. His ma probably had her evil eye on you the whole time. She'd have struck you dead if you didn't open that sweet mouth of yours. Enough, Gertrude. What's all this? We're preparing your bridal bed, my dear. And what's that smell? Cinnamon cloves and goat dung. It's tradition. If he gives you any trouble, put a dash of the cloves in his eye. And miss, look here. We got your hatchet nice and hidden under the pillars. Mother, why would I need a hatchet under my... Sigrid, there's something you've not been told about the wedding night. Oh, they don't never tell the bride till it's too late. Lucky both me and your mother survived our first night. Why wouldn't I survive? Is this because we are blending the tribes, north and south? No, my dear. It's because you are merging male and female. Always been dangerous, I'm afraid. You see, child, it's that first... Peak excitement in the wedding bed that transforms both bride and groom into their... Creature selves. Gertrude, your ancient impulse being. Mother, you're talking nonsense. Nearest, have you ever wondered why I have no sisters? Well, maybe. I did have sisters, but I could never tell you about them because we must not name those who never leave their wedding bed. (laughs) (laughs) What are you saying? Your life could end tonight, Munchkin. At that point, peak of excitement, if your creature selves don't get along. I cleaned the bloody mess that was left of your Aunt Jakai and her groom. His creature were a panther. She, a wee marmot. The ripping and tearing sounds that came from that bridal bed. Of course, your mother and father, now there was a happy match. Swans, the pair of them. High born with those beaks held up to the sky. So, I might die tonight? It's always a risk, marriages. The groom approaches. Quickly, get into your nightgown. I'd rather wear armor. No troubles, miss. I've taken the liberty to sew a few links of chain into the weave of your gown. <laughs> Here's what you must do, my darling. You must be open and innocent. You must go to him with no fear. No fear? Fear affects which creature self manifests. You just said he could kill me tonight. Or you could kill him, my lady. Uh, There's been some terrifying female forms. Well, what do I do if his creature is... uh, is... Well, that's what the hatchet's for, miss. What? The groom is here. Wait! I'm not ready! Mother! I am here. (laughs) It is time. All parties aside from the nuptials must depart this bedding place and stand outside the door in the safety of the foyer. (laughs) Yerg, don't leave me! 
got to say. Sprinkle some cardamom on the bed sheets for good luck, miss. Mother, wait. I've changed my mind. It's not your choice, my sweet. But... No fear, miss. Bridal for... Curtain! <clears throat> uh, so you ate the fish? And drank the piss. Your name is Sigrid? Yes. And you are Run? I am. And the serpent chose not to bite either of us. That's a good sign, don't you think? Maybe. You must begin, sir. No chips chat. Aye, here we are. Leave us be. I must admit, Sigrid, I am... Afraid? Yes. My mother says the favored creature of southern females is a Spanish tarantula that attacks the minute your trousers come off. My mother's sister married a northerner and was ripped limb from limb. Lift your veil. I want to look at your face. But it's not allowed until after. This might be my only chance. Would you deny your husband one gaze? All right. Oh. are beautiful. And you are truly rugged. <laughs> My nose is off a bit. Minor skirmish in the caucuses. Still, I will remember you with pleasure. Should it all... What are you doing? This nightgown weighs a ton. Wait! What's wrong? I, I, I want to know you first. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> no, I mean, I want to know you first. Me? Really? Yes. Wow! Well, I'm... I'm nobody, really. A, a philosopher, Prince. You are? It's too quiet in there. No screams at all. Maybe that creature sells the worms as such. Don't make noise. I like it when there's noise. Shh, stop it, stop it now. <laughs> Sir, is there anything else you need to complete your duties? Leave us be. But, sir, you, you... What did you say? They are seated on the bridal pile. It's a good sign. And they seem to be talking. Talking. Quiet. Something's happening. Finally. Oh. Tinder, <laughs> put your ear cup to the bar. Oh. 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 Aha. Oh. 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 oh, not cats and dogs. They'll be fighting till kingdom come. Wait. They, they are changing. Good Lord! What's happening, Tinder? They're not taking a final form. Oh. Well, how is that possible? Well, I've heard this happens with philosopher princess mistress. They think too damn much. My poor daughter. Oh, run. Keep looking into my eyes. I want to. Not yet, my love. Wait. I'm not sure I can. Wait. We're almost there. Oh, remarkable. That northern man's got steam power. All the fish, that's what that is. Vanished into dust. Ah. Oh. A bed. There on the bridal bed. Oh. Beautiful face. <laughs> and its nose is slightly off. Oh. Look at its parts. It's a fine strapping boy. Oh. Yes, but look underneath. 
Oh. A girl as well? It's both male and female. A sign from heaven. An omen? Good or bad? Call a priest! Oh, my darling. Mistress, please, I wouldn't touch it. Give me a blanket right now. Oh, you can't be thinking of keeping it, ma'am. I'll, we'll wrap you up, you gift from the universe. I'll embarrass the entire house, mistress. This is what happens when you mix the tribes. You, babe, from a heart's first encounter. The priests say. And just what do the priests say, Tyndall? Oh, I forget. Coochie, coochie, coochie. Uh. From Elizabeth Efron, everybody! Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Cello X. Elizabeth 
Saffron, Mildred Blue Mikes, Peggy Platt, and James Thurber. We want to thank Act Theater for having us, and special thanks to Root, Ida Miller, and the Act Lab. Our stage managers were Shigeko, Carlos Nakano, Teresa Micheletti, and Amanda Ray. The show was mixed by Brendan Hogan and recorded by Christopher Stewart. So, we're gonna bring out our lyric cards, cause now's the time in the show when we always love for you to sing along. I think you picked up the tune. Hmm? Ready? Here we go. Radio The Bridal Issue was recorded in front of a live audience at ACT Theatre in Seattle on June 6, 2016. It was engineered by Brendan Hogan, recorded by Christopher Stewart, and this podcast was mixed by Dave Pascal. Scott Augustin's story, The Clashing, appears in his collection Sleepover Stories, available for download on Amazon.com. The Pirate Don Dirk of Dowdy by Mildred Plue Meigs was adapted by Sandbox Radio co-producer Richard Zyman. Subscribe to the podcast in iTunes and Stitcher and find the episode archive, photos, and information on how to make a tax-deductible donation at sandboxradio.org. Sandbox Radio is made possible in part by a grant from 4Culture and the financial support of listeners like you. See you at Town Hall Seattle on August 29th with music from Teresa Holmes and Ed Key and special guest Jennifer Jasper. I'm your host for Sandbox Radio, Leslie Law. Thanks for listening.